Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that uh, we can come into this church, Lord, and be impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it be thrust to our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we may be transformed by your living word. We thank you for that. We thank you for these people. We thank you for those that are uh, not only on the internet that are su still supporting the church, but those that are here supporting the church. We're very grateful in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All righty. So uh, it is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is, oh, I got it. Did I do everything right? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm in the sermon, right? I'm looking at the clock, and I'm thinking I got 15 or 20 minutes to get this sermon done, which is probably not going to happen, so I'll just expedite the sermon. Palm Sunday is a day where, where we commemorate Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the beginning of Passion Week. You know, that word triumphal, I was like, is that even a word? I wasn't sure that, you know, triumph, you're triumphant. You know, triumphal, I said, is that even a word? Because we use that word theologically, but it is a word. I was glad to see that it is a word. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is a word to describe a great victory and or a great achievement. So why did they use this term, his triumphal entrance on that first Palm Sunday? We're going to be handing out, the ushers are going to be handing out palms today. The palms are not for swords. They're not to hit anybody with or put them in their face or put them in their nose. That's why... I've instructed the ushers over the last 15 years, do not give out the palms before the end of the service. Because there's always a few of you in the crowd, and it may even be our own deacons, that'll take the palms and try to tickle somebody with it. Or use it as a sword. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's, uh, it's, it's Jay or Don. I'm not mentioning them. There's, there's other deacons, I guess. There's one that's not here. But anyway, so we do that as an instruction, so there's no child's play. But the palms are representative of when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and they're putting down the palm trees, right? They're putting the palms down, the cloaks down to honor the king. So the palms are representative of honoring the king on Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It, mar it, it marks him as being hailed as the Messiah, leader, the leader that will free Israel from Roman authority. But as we recognize Palm Sunday is the beginning of Passion Week, it really has two different types of complexions. I think that as I read, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have a, a recitation of Palm Sunday. It's one, of the, it's one of the few things that each of the Gospels have and share in common. And it's interesting to read all of them, and I've been reading all of them all week long, and each of them has a different nuance to it, and it's interesting what each of the authors focused on being led by the Holy Spirit. But I think that we can agree that in Palm Sunday, there's two aspects to Palm Sunday. There's this triumphant entry of Jesus, the triumphal entrance of Jesus, which is the, uh, the exaltation of Christ, being recognized as Messiah and King, right? And then on the other side of that, and we'll read this very shortly, you have what I call the humiliation of Jesus, because he's being rejected by some, even on that very Palm Sunday, right? If you read in your bulletin, you'll see, we'll read this in a few moments, but you'll see that the Pharisees began to undermine Jesus on that particular Palm Sunday. So you have this triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into uh, Palm Sunday, you have the exaltation of Christ, and then you have the, uh, the dehumanization or uh, the humiliation of Jesus. So uh, we have both of those going on. So it's a very interesting uh, Palm Sunday is very interesting and unique, and I was, as I was doing my research this week, I was coming across some wonderful things that I, I do want to share with you uh, today, so I'll have to uh, be quick. But anyway, so Palm Sunday is the beginning of Passion Week, right? We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then, of course, Saturday and Sunday. So each day has a particular aspect to it. Uh, we have Palm Sunday, which is today, and then we have Holy Monday, uh, things happen uh, with the withering of the fig tree or the fig with no fruit. That happens on Monday when Jesus went to Bethany. We have Holy uh, Tuesday, which is called the Olivet Discourse, which is a tremendous, uh, tremendous discourse and teaching that Jesus gives. Look, and I'm not going to be able to explain all these to you now because I'm short on time. But, uh, you know, these are wonderful things. These are theological concepts and writings of Scripture that are, that are off the charts. They're so good. The Olivet Discourse is a, a beautiful thing to study. Maybe someday I'll do a, a teaching on the Olivet Discourse and, and break it down uh, each, uh, each thing. 
Also, on Monday, we believe that Jesus went in and cleared the temple. Remember when he went in and turned over the money changers and said, you've, you've taken my house of prayer and turned it into a den of thieves? There's a lot of things going on in the last week of Jesus' life. This is Passion Week, right? We should have passion for Christ this week, right? I mean, Passion Week, this is the last week of Jesus' earthly existence until after the resurrection where he's in a, in a transformed way, right? And then, of course, he's there for 40 days and then he ascends to heaven. So this is the last week of his earthly life. As a human being, as a man, the God-man. Fully God and fully man. Blood and bones. And he felt the things that you feel. He felt the pain and rejection and separation. Anything that you've ever felt in your life. Jesus went through this, the passion week. It was his passion. His passion for God and his passion for you. Those are the things that led him to the cross. His passion for God and his passion for you. Don't ever forget that. Individually and collectively. He knows the plans that he has for you. He has plans of prosperity for you and blessings. Amen. Spiritual blessings. <clears throat> so we have that going on on Monday. Tuesday is the Olivet Discourse. Holy Wednesday they talk and they remember the uh, Judas uh, uh, trading on Jesus and turning him in. Then Thursday is Monday Thursday and it's the Last Supper, celebrated the Last Supper of Jesus with the disciples. Then, of course, Good Friday is the crucifixion. And then Holy Saturday, uh, we talk and we remember. Now, this is a very interesting thing. I'm not going to open up that can of worms or that Pandora's box. Let's just call it the time in the tomb. Let's just call it the time in the tomb on Saturday. Because a lot of things could have been going on in the time in the tomb. And then, of course, uh, Easter Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. So that's, uh, that's what we have as far as uh, Holy Week is concerned. Now, all four Gospels uh, talk about Palm Sunday as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, I've used Luke's narrative because I think Luke's narrative is, is very interesting, and we'll be able to unpack that very shortly and very quickly. Uh, but he mentions the Mount of Olives, and the reason I chose Luke's Gospel is a secret. But I'll tell you why I chose Luke's Gospel and recitation of the triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday. Because he mentions the Mount of Olives, which is very significant. And if I can teach you one thing today and circumvent my whole sermon and try to break it down, it's the significance of the Mount of Olives. It's not what you think it would be. So the question is this. Why is there a reference to the Mount of Olives uh, in this particular reading? So I'm going to read this to you. If you tune, turn to your bulletin and turn on the back of it, it's a fairly lengthy recitation of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which references the first Palm Sunday. It's different than what I read to you when I first started the church service. This is, uh, this is found in Luke. I read to you what was found in Matthew. And it's Luke 19, verses 28 to 44. <clears throat> after, the, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the ground. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in not loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Amen. What a beautiful recitation. But let me explain to you the theological things to Palm Sunday. These are the things that we read and study as theologians on our own. We usually don't bring them forth oftentimes because they're a little complicated, and they're even complicated for us. So I'm still processing some of this information that I'm sharing with you. But Palm Sunday contemplates two Advents. Let me tell you what I mean by two Advents. We all know Advent season. When is Advent season? It's during Christmas, right? We are awaiting the birth of the king. 
And on Christmas, Christmas Day, we celebrate Christmas Day, it's the birth of Jesus. It's the birth narratives of the little baby in the manger. That's the advent. The advent of the king, the advent of the savior of the world. Salvador Munde, savior of the world. That was an advent. Palm Sunday contemplates two advents. The advent of Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem as king is an advent. They've been waiting and expecting Jesus, the Messiah, to come to Jerusalem. And there's a very interesting scripture you may not know. It says here, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Do you know why that's said? Because if people did not offer praise to Jesus in his triumphal entry on that first Palm Sunday, the buildings and the stones and all of Jerusalem would have worshipped the king as the advent of the Messiah comes into Jerusalem. It's a powerful moment. It's an important moment. But it also contemplates a second advent. And the second advent is the return of Jesus Christ. Because he mentions the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is where Christ will return. It's, it's the, by no accident. By, but because Luke mentions the Mount of Olives. Because Luke understands the prophecies in Zechariah. And the prophecies of Zechariah spell all this out. So it's not by happenstance that Jesus happens to be standing on the Mount of Olives as he's saying these things. Because he's going to return to that very place. So it contemplates two advents. And what do I mean by that? Let me go to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to take you on a spiritual journey in 10 minutes, if I can. When the judge says, hurry up, be quick. You know, that's the most annoying thing in the world. <laughs> When you're in the middle of an opening statement or a closing statement and you're hitting all the points that you need to hit or you're cross-examining a witness and the judge says, well, hurry up, let's try, try to wrap this up, counsel. Man, it just throws you off. You want to finish your thoughts. Amen. So right now, the heavenly judge is telling me, finish it up, wrap it up. You only got a few minutes left. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Listen to this. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way. You have seen him go into heaven. This is talking about the ascension. But he's coming back the same place he left. He's coming back for us. He's coming back for the church. So Palm Sunday contemplates two advents. Not only his triumphal entrance as king, but his return as Messiah and Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And Luke and Acts picks this up and it correlates. If you look how nicely this works together, your bulletin says Luke 19, verse 28 to 44. But he also wrote Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Why? Because he knew the spirit placed upon him. And he knew. It opened his eyes. And he was reflective. And he looked into the perspective of the Old Testament. So in Palm Sunday, in a way, it's a spiritual journey, right? And although you can't see my notes and you can't see what I wrote, and I won't get to it all, it's almost like present day Palm Sunday, when Jesus is triumphant entry into Jerusalem, right? We have that moment in time, right? And during that moment in time, we're also looking back to the Old Testament prophecies about this Messiah riding on a colt entering Jerusalem, right? So you have that present moment, then you have historically what had happened, and then you have prospectively what will happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's a masterpiece. Amen. The writings of Palm Sunday are so complex and so weird, I could stay here from now until next week telling you all about it. It's that complicated. The mind of God, the plan of God is wonderful. Palm Sunday is a wonderful day to give thanks and praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. So when we look at this and we look at these two advents and we look at the exaltation of Jesus Christ as exalted as king and we look at his humiliation that he's rejected. Look at these Pharisees. Hey, Peter and everybody else. Tell the Pharaoh, tell them disciples to be quiet. Why are they doing this? Why are they putting down their cloaks? Why are they putting down palm branches? Why are they 
having him ride in on a donkey, that's only reserved for the king and the Messiah. This is out of balance, they're saying, right, the Pharisees. Well, the reason is, is he is king and Messiah. And they're doing what's appropriate, and they're doing what Old Testament scripture has referenced and prophesied, that when the Messiah comes into Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. He's going to be on a donkey. People are going to be waving palm branches. They're going to be putting their cloaks on the road and putting palms on the road because the entrance of the king, the triumphant entry or triumphal entry of the king is upon Jerusalem. And if the people didn't worship the Lord, the rocks would. And Jerusalem would cry out. I would have loved to have seen that or heard about it, right? There's sounds coming from the buildings. The stones and the rocks are making noises. They're moving. Wouldn't that be tremendous? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if they didn't worship me, the rocks would. That's right. That's, that is what it said. You're a lunatic to believe something like, oh, I'm a lunatic for Christ. I'm a theological lunatic for Jesus because I happen to believe what the scripture tells me. And if Jesus says the rocks would cry out if they didn't worship me, then that means those rocks are going to have some good voices like the worship team. That's right. They're going to worship him. Amen. So Palm Sunday, Jesus is contemplating the course of events. He's contemplating in his mind Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday and everything in between. And he's contemplating what he's going to have to go through. He knows now it's the beginning of the end of his earthly ministry. But it's the beginning and the reconciliation of all humanity. Amen. Amen. If this could be accomplished. And you know, when I talk to other theologians, and they ask me, well, you know, the cross, his crucifixion, that was all set. That was, that was going, that, that had to happen. No, no, it, it didn't. No, it was God's plan that it happened. It was God's will that it happened. But it wasn't fatalistic in that it wasn't already set and done. Jesus had a process through. All those days right. and all those situations and depend upon God in his humanity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we like to, we like to, you know, see, Jesus isn't like a water faucet where we can turn it on and off. Oh, in this situation, he's God. In this situation, he's man. Meaning when he overcomes the devil, he's God. You know, when he's in his humanity and he's upset and he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's praying to the Lord, Lord, take this cup from me. He's man. And then when he overcomes Satan, he's God. No, he's fully man during all these progressions. And yet he's fully God, but yet he's going through all these things as we would. And he overcame these things, which is extraordinary. It's not fatalistic. It's not preordained. It wasn't like Jesus had no decision to make. He was making decisions each and every day all through Passion Week. And look at what this says here when he's talking about, look at what the prophet and uh, Zechariah says it's very interesting because uh, Luke mentions these things. Look at what is written in Zechariah chapter 9 at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding a donkey on a colt, the foil of a donkey. Hundreds of years before the first Palm Sunday. This is being prophesied. And then another one. What a beautiful this. Look at this one. Let me just read this for you very quickly. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. This is a prophecy. A day of the Lord is coming when you will plunder, be divided among you. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured. The house is ransacked. The women raped. Half of the city will go into exile. But the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Listen to this, though. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and split the Mount of Olives will be split into from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half the valley moving south. You will flee by mountain valley for it will be extended to Ezeel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. This is the second advent of Christ. Amen. His return. 
It's not Palm Sunday they're contemplating here. Palm Sunday was already prophesied. I just read that to you a few verses ago. This is the second advent that Palm Sunday contemplates. Palm Sunday contemplates two advents. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem as King and Messiah, and it contemplates his ultimate return to us and the church and the world. And it will be at the Mount of Olives, right where he prophesied and right where his triumphal entry was when he was standing there and he ascended into heaven. Beautifully done. Beautifully done, Dr. Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I would say to Luke, what has, what has, you know, uncloaked these things to you? How did you know this? And he would say, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me end this. I'm going to end here. What, what a bot shot this is, because I've got 12 pages of notes, and I'm just trying to go from the top of my head. So I hope you learn at least something today. The two advents of Palm Sunday, his triumphal entry and his ultimate advent and return, right? But let me read this to you. This is beautiful. I want to end here. The Gospel of John is, is highly Christological. The most Christological book we have in all the Bible, meaning Christ is exalted to preeminent positions. And John's recitation of Palm Sunday is a little bit different than everybody else's. And he captures something. He captures the humanity of people and also the disciples. And I want to use this to encourage us to have faith in God. And this week is so special. We should all be contemplating what he did for us this whole week. And each day there's something that went on. You can read your Bibles and, and find out each and every day what went on. But listen to what John writes. And this is the triumphal entry. This is his recitation of Palm Sunday. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. The triumphal entrance of the King. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found the donkey and sat upon it as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. <laughs> Their eyes were opened and they realized that their friend, this prophet, this miracle worker, this great man, this gentle, beautiful man that they did terrible things to, terrible things to, this gentle, beautiful man laid his life down for every one of you here. That's right, amen. And every person that's ever been born in this universe and world, he laid his life down for them. That's what Passion Week represents. They didn't understand this at this time, but we do now. We understand the significance of Palm Sunday, the two Advents, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and his triumphal return for us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, and we thank you that we can hear this word of God we can hear and understand the significance of Palm Sunday and how that event that happened 2,000 years ago is as relevant today as it was yesterday. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.